Hey everyone! In my last video, I talked about how powerful culture is, and how the pressures on us from culture create a kind of dictatorship it's hard to escape from. This video is kind of a part two. It's about another intangible source of oppression, ideology. When people hear the word ideology, they think of things like Marxism, maybe liberalism, maybe an unorthodox political party, something like that. But an ideology is just a system of ideas, and the dominant ideology of anywhere forms the backbone of the culture. The dominant ideology, ideology of most cultures are also a kind of dictatorship. But like culture, ideology can be changed and even used to liberate people. How? Let's talk about that too! I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Ideas are just as alive as we are. They're alive in us. And they're more powerful than us as individuals. Because if one of us dies, the idea lives on. That's what's so appealing to people about these right-wing ideologies like patriotism, nationalism, racism, white supremacy. They make us belong to something bigger than us, even though that something doesn't really exist. They apparently belong to the people, even though any thorough reading of history would show that's nonsense. And they're an exclusive club. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're something to believe in, and even something to fight for. But are they? Surely it depends on your values, and if your values line up perfectly with the dominant ideology, you might want to question them. I don't know how old you are, but I remember 9-11 quite well. And I remember George W. Bush coming on TV a couple of days after and telling Americans, the terrorists hate us for our freedom, for our democracy, for other things we supposedly value. And he said quite plainly that terrorism is a threat to our way of life. By way of life, he meant to encapsulate anything an American thinks of when they think of America. The less specific he is, the more the individual can fill in the blanks. This speech had several uses. Uh, for one, it told Americans there's a global Muslim terrorist conspiracy out there they should be afraid of. That part worked. Millions of people still believe that. Thousands of people have made millions of dollars off this lie. You might even say it's become part of the ideology of the American right. Second, like many political speeches, it appealed to and reinforced what people have been told are their beliefs. We're a democracy, and that's why we're fighting. We believe in freedom, and that's why we're fighting. Of course, this, this, this supposed belief they all fall apart when you actually examine them, but nobody ever does examine them. Americans went to war because they were afraid, really. And if you're scared enough, you'll cling to any belief or hope you've been given. The only way to feel safe is to wave a flag while watching kids go off to kill other kids on the other side of the world. The third thing the speech did was manufacture consent for the coming war on terror by saying this attack was caused not by a foreign policy that can be easily changed to stop creating more terrorists, but by our values. They want to kill us because of who we are. Well, we don't want to change who we are. So a nation of sheep trotted into war because one, one terrorist attack was painted to look like an attack on the national ideology. So ideology is powerful stuff. Some people think where they're from doesn't have an ideology, that they weren't 
indoctrinated into any ideology or several overlapping ideologies, and instead have an accurate understanding of the world. Those people are wrong. In fact, they exemplify Goethe's uh, observation that no one is more of a slave than one who falsely believes that they're free. Not realizing you've been indoctrinated or denying it is a sure sign you believe someone else's beliefs, think someone else's thoughts, and dance to someone else's beat. In other words, your ideas serve someone other than you. And that's most of us. We've all been dumbed down by someone else's ideas. And I'm going to do a whole series of videos on those ideas and so on, but let's see if I can summarize them here. What does your culture value? Remember from my last video, culture is largely assumptions and beliefs about every aspect of life, and they're largely below the surface. So how do you know what your culture values? Is it because somebody told you? And you keep hearing the words? I hear the word freedom come out of the mouths of Americans whose actions show they clearly hate freedom, or at least everyone else's freedom. So words are not enough to understand a culture. Do people in your culture actually live the values they say they do? And wouldn't they be better off questioning some of those values? Let's look at some of the things we believe in or say we believe in. We believe in democracy because democracy serves as a fig leaf for who really runs things. We don't spend much time thinking about what democracy means, or what it means to be represented, or even what the people means. Surely if we really wanted the people in charge, we wouldn't have states controlled only by the richest and most influential among us. But we've been told all our lives that that's democracy, and democracy is the best way to organize society, so obviously, so obviously, the best. In fact, that we elevate it almost to the status of a god. People are willing to kill and die for it. And the only conceivable alternative to so-called democracy is authoritarian rule. It's never getting rid of the so-called democratic state and just letting people be free, because as everyone knows, that would be chaos. We believe in the rule of law for all the same reasons. We need other people making laws over us, or else we'd be running around killing each other. Because apparently the only thing that holds back the crimson tide of human nature is the magic of the law and the police. We believe in capitalism because we've been told all our lives the alternative to capitalism is for tens of millions of people to die by some mystical process called socialism. And I don't know what socialism is, but I know capitalism is better. So it's fine that we have a class system where some people have enough money to end poverty around the world and spend it on boats and jets and houses and ski lodges, or else just leave millions or billions of dollars in bank accounts, while other people are digging in dumpsters. Because capitalism is a big part of the dominant ideology, it basically goes unquestioned, along with the belief that the poor are poor, because they don't work hard enough. And because we believe in capitalism, we believe in jobs. Have some kind of financial problem? Get a job. Got a job and still have financial problems? Get another job. Make money for someone else. That's freedom. Start your own business, even. It only costs thousands of dollars most people don't have. You could go into debt to start a business, maybe take out a second mortgage. And sure, most businesses fail, but that's okay. Just pick yourself back up, dust yourself off, and I guess try again. And we apparently believe in jobs because they're the means to getting what we are, we're all told to dream about. Buying a house, growing a lawn, raising a family with one member of the opposite sex buying a car, 
vacationing for two whole weeks in the year, and generally being a bland, middle-class, straight white family. If you don't have all those things, it's considered acceptable to call the police to kick you out of a neighborhood full of people who do. We believe in countries, I don't even know what countries are, and nation-states, that we somehow belong to a nation-state because we've been told that our nationalism and even war are normal, natural, the right way to be. Where are you from? I was born in a nation-state. That's the imagined community who gave me my identity. How about you? Yes, I was born in a nation-state too. I also consider subservience to lines on a map a virtue. Like capitalism, the nation-state is a relatively new invention, yet it's given the air of a primordial truth, something we've always been and will always be. That's one way to keep these ideas alive. We believe things like poverty, war, racism, and so on are inevitable or natural, because we live under a system that necessarily creates and thrives on things like war, poverty, and racism, when in fact they're inventions, unnecessary, only harmful to most people, but very useful to our rulers. We believe in progress so that more people can accept their shitty conditions and not fight back with the blind hope that things are going to get better and everything will be okay. And so that destroying the environment or watching the stock market go up and down can, can be called good things that bring progress and growth and prosperity to everyone. Layoffs, stagnant wages, crashes, collapses, don't worry. Things will be better than ever before you know it. And don't even think of proposing an alternative, because then the deep roots of ideology take over the conscious brain, and you get branded an unreasonable and dangerous extremist. The idea that the economy can and indeed must grow infinitely is hammered into us in every turn. We have to believe in progress, or the whole economy will collapse. What else do we believe in? We believe in school, because the only way anyone can even think a child should be taught anymore is by sitting them down and throwing facts at them for eight hours a day, curbing their every natural impulse by means of discipline and punishment. Our belief in jail isn't that different. Concentrate people in one place, discipline them so they act like us, ignore all data saying it doesn't work. After all, we're talking about belief. When you have belief, data, facts, and even just counter-arguments are heresy. If you don't believe in all your culture's beliefs, you'll get into arguments, you'll be ridiculed, you'll alienate friends, maybe even face exile. If you don't think the same way the rest of us do, you must be a bad person. I've been saying we here to mean, I guess, white North Americans, which is pretty much the closest thing to a group I know and can talk about. But these values have spread quite far around the world, so that activists all around the world talk about democracy, free markets, the rule of law, jobs, money, schools, and nation states. If you've read much by Antonio Gramsci, you might already get it. But if not, to summarize, it's largely because places like the US and UK, which embody these ideologies, have spread them around the world. But if these things aren't in our interest, or let's say are not necessarily in our interests and it should at least be rigorously questioned before we choose to agree with them, why do so many people believe in them? The short answer sounds like a kind of conspiracy to, to getting us to believe in all these things, but it's, it's not always conscious. 
Believers in ideology spread it unconsciously. Our parents induct us into this cult by teaching us all the things we're supposed to believe and point them out to us throughout all our lives. Uh, get a job. Get money. Buy a house. Get married. Don't worry about the wars and the poors. Just make money so you don't have to think about them. In school, we're told we're being prepared for getting a job. They're actually open about the fact that school kills independent thought, saying its purpose is to reduce you to another obedient, tax-paying, law-abiding worker. Because that's all our parents are, and that's all our parents care about. And that's what the people in power want. University is just an extension of school in that way. Contrary to what most right-wingers claim, the vast majority of academics follow, follow the ruling party line, making them, you know, mostly either vaguely liberal or center-right. The media uncritically plays speeches by politicians or others who talk about our supposed values and, and our interests, what, what they say our interests are. And election results show that people like to hear words like family and democracy and tough on crime, with no regard to what the politicians actually do. So people who consume a lot of news imbibe the ideology of those news sources, which hardly ever strays too far from the dominant beliefs of society. As you can see, a social order does not need to be based on facts. As long as enough people believe in enough of the myths of the culture, the current order can continue. But ideology isn't just for you to accept and embrace your own servitude. They can be liberatory, too. They can enlighten people to their condition. They can provide a flag for resistors to rally around. It depends what they say and how you use them. After all, people use the hope of democracy and jobs and bread to rebel against dictators. What I propose, aside from reading and discussing theory and applying it to your situation, which I, I and a lot of other people like me think is very important, um, is at least questioning those values you're told you believe in, and considering whether they could and should have more, more than just jobs and bread and democracy. Socialism was su always supposed to be liberatory, liberation for the workers from the horrors of capitalism. It's good that it's supposedly coming back into fashion now. Um, it's got a long history of theory and practice, and I hope people who call themselves socialists know some of it, rather than just supporting Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and thinking that makes you a socialist. Though many revolts in the name of socialism have failed, as in they failed to hand the workers ownership of the means of production, it doesn't make socialism impossible. It just means people with socialist ideals need to learn from past mistakes. It's not easy to supplant one ideology for another. It's a long struggle against oppressors and oppressive thinking. Anarchism is a particularly radical form of socialism, but it's so far away from the dominant international ideology of capitalism and nation states that most people would reject it out of hand. It's blasphemy. But there might be elements of a culture you can use as a wedge issue to plant a seed. Most Americans are close to ideas like anarchism and communism, but you could still appeal to their belief in freedom by showing them all the ways they're not free and why, and their belief in democracy by pointing out that true democracy would be at the grassroots level, and maybe rebellion, the way so many American cultural icons were rebellions, and why you can't be a rebel if you support Donald Trump, the police, or the military. You can reintroduce heroes from history and show them how they, for instance, uh, fought for unions against bosses, strike breakers, the police, and even the FBI and KKK. You can teach people about other cultures throughout history that have avoided subjugation and how they did it, like in the book The Art of Not Being Governed, 
by James C. Scott, or uh, Anarchy in Action by Colin Ward, or maybe the work of George Woodcock. You could just Google examples of resistance, rebellion, revolution, and anarchy. I bet your history is full of them. You can challenge people's dominant views on the dominant ideology. I don't know how much time is the right amount to spend, but I wouldn't spend too much time on people who aren't interested in listening, because ideology is a mental prison, and most people, unfortunately, are quite comfortable there. But you can keep the key within reach. Most people need to be told something several times by several people before it makes sense to them, if it ever does. But they can learn. I'm here, and so are you. If there are enough of us, we might just be able to turn the world into one that actually lives the values that it preaches. Thanks, friends. See you next week.